Okay, great. So this is a really short explainer about exploring if your model is any good. Uh, so this is all about um, a couple of valid, or well, three validation plots that you can plot um, that are going to help you explore um, how your model performed uh, over your test data that you're going to have held out. Um, quick explainer, um, pretty easy. Uh, examples of these, all three of these, are given in the walkthrough so you can see them in action. So don't worry how you physically plot them using code, uh, but just kind of focus on the concepts of what they are and what they're telling you about your model. So let's get on with it. Uh, so the first one that we look at is really easy. It's for a regression task. So regression task, supervised learning, where we're going to use labeled data to try and predict a continuous variable, a number. Um, so one easy plot that we can do is we can make a simple scatter plot of the predicted against the true values. Uh, so for each of our um, components in our test data, so test data that we've held out and not shown the model at training, um, we can then put it through our model once we've trained it and, and then make predictions. Um, so each of those predictions for each of the test sets represents a dot on this graph We'll have a predicted value versus a true value. Now the perfect model lines up on the line where the true and predicted value are equal. So it's a bit of an odd game really. What you're trying to do is build a model which gives you the most boring plot possible. It just sits along this line. Typically because of noisy data, um, not a perfect model, you won't see that. Uh, but you might see lots of interesting things that help you understand where your model might be proved, improved. Um, so there might be outliers in your data, which you can go and explore. Why is your model made particularly bad predictions for those cases? And you might see that, I haven't shown it here, but say if you had some data out here, a bit of a cluster, you could go and look specifically about what it was in that, those examples uh, that your model did particularly badly on. Maybe they weren't, you know, need a different kind of model for those points. Don't know. Lots of different things you can look at. Um, you could see if there was any structure in this model, so, for example, this data that I've kind of made up is kind of distributed around the perfect model. So it just suggests that it's kind of driven by noise. But say we had a nice sort of curve around this model. Structure represents the fact that we could improve or enrich the representation of our model to get a better fit uh, and sort of improve those predictions. So really useful plot, simple plot to do, uh, which allows you to diagnose the performance of your model. So the second one is called a confusion matrix and, and you can visualize a confusion matrix. Basically, it's the same as this plot, so predicted versus true. But instead for a regression task, we're now looking at classification. So let's first look over the left hand side. What you've got here is you've got a confusion matrix for a multi-class classification problem. So in this case, it has four possible output, uh, output labels. This means we've trained a model which has taken inputs and then it's spat out one of four classes. So what you see here are the numbers over the test set which um, we've used to validate our model. So if you added up all the numbers in the matrix, this would equal the total number of samples we have in our test set. Um, what we really want is all of the values to line up along this diagonal. This means when we've predicted class 1, we've uh, it's been correct. The true label is class 1, class 2, class 2, class 3, class 3, and class 4, and class 4. So the number of correct results in your test set are basically found by adding up uh, the whole of the diagonal. Now anything off diagonal represents an error in your model. This occurs when you've predicted a different class to the label class. In general, these are non-symmetric. And what we mean by that is the model won't necessarily predict threes instead of ones or ones instead of threes with the same frequency. Uh, so it's not a symmetric matrix. Um, but um, it will maybe if it has structure, it tells you that okay, on average, most of our errors here, let's look at 41, for example, these are made up numbers for representation. But you might say, oh, okay, there seems to be some confusion, hence the name, between um, predicting label one and label four, and something to go and explore. 
So a simpler version of this, so I, I started with a more complicated version where this is a multi-class classification problem, um, not too complicated, but the simpler version of this is around binary classification. And so we have terms for each of these numbers in the binary classification setting. So the diagonals, so this is again predicted versus true, um, and then we have label or not the label, so one or zero. In the case where we've predicted a positive value and it was a positive value, these are the cool, these are the true positives. True negatives are the number that we've um, correctly predicted as negative. False negatives um, are when we've um, uh, we've we've actually classified something as negative or false um, um, when it should have been positive. Uh, and so these are actually a worry in things like medical diagnosis. You, this means you've missed something that was actually true. So something you want to avoid. On the whole, a false positive is when you said, well, actually, I think it is this condition, but it doesn't turn out to be. So actually, we see, depending on our application, whether we preference false negatives or false positives really, um, really depends on the application. And then we have these various, and I've been through it in another lecture on when we look at classification, about different sort of metrics around the performance of binary classifiers, so sensitivity versus precision. Uh, so go and look that up if you're interested in those different terms. I find them quite hard to remember sometimes, so I must admit I have to look them up, but um, they're useful ideas and concepts to understand or know how you can get the information. Confusion matrix, pretty easy to plot got some really good examples so if you want to reuse that code for your own example go and find it in one of the walkthroughs for classification okay so the final one is called an ROC and the area under an ROC and I have to admit I find this quite hard to interpret and I find I have to really think quite hard about what it's telling me so I'm going to give it a go <laughs> I might sort of have to think on the fly about how it works um, actually, on the face of it, it's quite a good curve of just comparing one classifier against another. You can easily see if something's kind of in, in a sort of quotations better. Um, but actually, going through the logic of how it's constructed can be a bit, um, you know, not clear always. I think partly the problem with this is its name. So ROC stands for Receive Operated Characteristic. I was like, oh, where on earth does that come from? But apparently it comes from sometime in uh, just uh, in the Second World War to do with signal processing. Um, so it's an obscure name. Don't draw too much on it. Okay, so before we actually look what's in the plot, um, what the ROC curve is, is a basically a plot of false positive rate versus true positive rate. Now, false positive rate is the number of false positives um, so this is when we um, incorrectly classify something as positive uh, divided by the number of false positives plus the number of true negatives. Um, equally, the true positive rate are the number of true positive um, samples, so when we classify it right, um, divided by the number of true positive plus the, the number of false negatives. Okay, so what we're going to look at here is basically we're going to plot out for a given classifier a curve. This is a curve for different thresholds, um, um, classification thresholds of a binary classifier. So remember, in a binary classifier, what we get to spit out is a probability or score of how likely the positive outcome is. Um, so when we have a very high threshold, um, say one um, of a classifier, that means that we must be 100% certain to classify the outcome as a positive. In this case, we're unlikely to ever be 100% certain about uh, classifying something as, as true. And so in this case, we, um, in this case, the classifier would never class classify anything as true. This means we get no true positives because we assign nothing as positive. We also get no false positives because we also don't assign anything as positive. Um, okay, so in this case, for a very high classification threshold, we start at the position zero, zero on this graph. As we lower that classification threshold, so we allow more and more 
um, uh, classification are true depending on the output of, of the prediction from the binary classifier, then this curve increases. So let's go to the other extreme end. When the classification threshold is zero, basically this thing always classifies everything as, as positive. And so the um, number of true negatives is zero, but also the number of false negatives is zero. So this one ends up being both uh, false positives divided by false positives, which will be one, and this will be true positives divided by true positives, which will also be one. So this is why this curve for, for a zero threshold basically comes um, at, uh, goes to one, one. Right, so now let's look at a classifier which is completely random. As we change this threshold, basically a random classifier basically equally 50-50 assigns a value, uh, either as true or positive. And so the, the, a random classifier is represented by this straight line. A perfect classifier is kind of this um, unattainable kind of achievement of um, this, this very square looking perfect classifier. And basically what we see, any classification um, model in between this random classifier and perfect we actually see um, a better and better models. So this yellow curve uh, is not as good as a classifier that sits at this, um, this blue curve. So it's an easy way of seeing how um, two relative classifiers for a given task perform against each other. Now the area under this curve gives kind of the measure, the average measure of success of the model over um, its ability to distinguish uh, the outcomes over kind of all thresholds it's like an average quantity so for a random classifier the area under the curve so the area under in red here is 0.5 and the better and better they are all the way to perfect it becomes one so this gives a simple quantitative measure this area under this curve of the relative performance of two classifiers so you can sort of see how two classifiers do against each other right so as i said um there, these are three simple examples of plots that we typically use in validation. The first one is a regression one. Um, the, the last two are used in classification. Um, you will see examples of this throughout the course uh, in the walkthroughs, and they give you like snippets of code that you can you can actually plot these curves out for different problems. Go and go and find those. Go and try them out. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, really useful things to, uh, as ways to display and interrogate, or in presentations, show how well uh, different models are performing against each other. Great.